All right. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. Apologies, I think we're like one or two minutes late, having a little bit of technical problems, and I totally put my hand up. Uh, one of those sort of automatic update situations right before you go live. Uh, but we're super, we're super excited to be here with you today. We have an amazing panel. Um, I'm Jason Medley, Chief People Officer with Codility. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Codility, we're a technical assessment platform. Um, we really help make technical hiring faster and we level the playing ground for, uh, for, for engineering. And so i um, super excited to talk today at really sort of predicting the future of talent and sort of what that looks like, especially in this COVID era and what's coming out of the post-COVID era and what all that will look like. And we couldn't have a better group with us. And, and before we do introductions, just uh, a couple of things, a, a couple of sort of housekeeping uh, sort of guidelines to throw out there for you. One is this is completely interactive. So we absolutely encourage all of you to chat away. Um, you have a ch everyone has access to a chat box. Feel free to introduce yourself, say hello at any time, ask questions. Um, we absolutely will, um, you, you know, we will entertain your questions at the end. We're going to have a Q&A time and uh, we want to hear your expertise as well. We, we are not, uh, you know, we know that there's a lot of people in here who have opinions and thoughts as well. And we absolutely want to hear them. Challenge anything we say today. We're open to that as well. I love a good challenge. Um, but, um, but, and then one other thing, toward, towards the end, right before our formal Q&A time, which is going to be about 10 or 15 minutes, um, you're going to have a quick poll that's going to pop up on your screen for about 30 seconds. If everyone could just complete that, um, I just want to give you a heads up so it's not a moment of, of awkwardness and we all kind of expect it. Um, but without further ado, super excited to be here. Again, I'm Jason Medley, Chief People Officer with Codility. I'll be moderating today uh, this amazing and beautiful panel. Um, so to start out with, I'd love for the panel to sort of introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, the company you work for, your role, and, and I think also um, maybe just kind of what keeps motivating you every day. And um, Shweta, maybe we'll maybe we'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. My name is Shweta Jacob. I am a recruiting lead at Lever, so I get to work for a company that's trying to solve my problems um, and had previously been a client. I am actually based in Toronto, where it's quite chilly today. Uh, and I do recruiting not only just for Toronto, but also um, over the, through the U.S. Uh, I've been doing engineering recruiting, customer success, sales, and everything else you can imagine. Um, and really what keeps me motivated every day is just talking to really cool uh, people and getting to hire them so that they become my, my new friends at work. Um, so that's what, that's what I love to do. Amazing. Welcome. We're so excited to have you. Um, huge fan of Lever as well, so welcome. Uh, Ty. Thanks, Jason. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Ty Abernathy. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of Grayscale. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Grayscale, we're a texting and automation platform. Um, we offer a really deep integration with ATSs like Lever and Greenhouse and some others. Um, but our focus is really on um, uh, helping recruiting teams create a really high touch candidate experience uh, to eliminate gaps in communication throughout the process um, and leverage automation thoughtfully um, to create those kind of right touch points at the right time throughout the process. So uh, what keeps me motivated? Uh, I My background's in recruiting. I, I love solving recruiting challenges um, and I love helping companies solve their recruiting challenges. So uh, that keeps me pretty motivated. <clears throat> Awesome. Welcome. And 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 Ty and I kind of go way back. Probably it's been about maybe 10, maybe 10 years now, Ty, right? Like oh, back to oh, our days yeah. in New York. So it's been fun following uh, Ty's career and he is a really great thought leader and sort of candidate experience and and what that looks like. So so welcome. And then of course Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks for including me. I'm very excited to be a part of this conversation. And thanks everyone who attended today. I'm really grateful that you guys set aside some time to, to join in too. My name is Jeremy Tolan. I'm the partnerships manager at Spark Hire. Uh, Spark Hire is a video interviewing platform. I work closely with our partners to ultimately help organizations make their hiring process more accurate, collaborative, and enjoyable for everyone that's involved. 
and the success stories of the organizations that Spark Hire has been able to help have been really motivating to me. And also, I, I'm really passionate about helping out my fellow team members at Spark Hire. So seeing them achieve their goals and seeing them grow in both their personal and professional lives has also been really motivating for me too. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, thanks for being here to all three of you. And um, and I just want to say I love this panel because not not only do you sort of have day to day jobs, um, but you also very much um, you're working for companies and products that are very much in this space that are very much talking about this conversation all the time. You you have a you have a very sort of clear lens into the problems that a lot of companies are faced around talent and and you're, you're you're having this conversation about the future of talent and the landscape and what that looks like a lot and so um to kind of just jump into it uh, i'd love to start out with each one of you and and any of you you know feel free to jump in here but um how are you how are you really sort of seeing the hiring landscape now so maybe at your own company maybe in partners that you're working with but what is sort of in the midst of a COVID-19 era in this world that we find ourselves in, what, how would you describe the, the hiring landscape today? I can jump in there. Um, and I think like a lot of companies earlier uh, this year, you know, hiring really slowed down. Um, we, we saw that ourselves at Lever, we saw that with our customers in terms of their hiring, um, but we've actually been seeing it as years gone on, especially late summer into the fall. We're actually starting to see it pick up again. It's not, you know, I don't think it's in the high growth that we were, especially in the tech sector previously, um, but we are seeing a slow and steady, I would say, uh, rise in recruiting. Um, and I'm finding companies are being a little bit more thoughtful about what roles they need um, and what roles they can maybe do without at this time. No, I, I love that. I, I think that even at Codility, we're very much, you know, I think when COVID first hit, every company was sort of just holding their breath for a moment, right? And we <laughs> sort of needed a, a yeah. moment, where are we going? What does business look like? And and I think especially as we're thinking about 2021, it gives us a chance to sort of reset and think about priorities. Um, Jeremy and Ty, what, what about you guys? What are you sort of seeing? Yeah, I think there was definitely a lot of uncertainty at first back in the spring. And I think it was really challenging for organizations to set concrete hiring plans because no one really knew what to expect. But I think those plans are becoming clearer and clearer. Still a little bit of uncertainty. Some organizations have been hiring more than ever. A lot of them, uh, their hiring really slowed down too. But um, unfortunately, there were a lot of layoffs earlier on in the pandemic also. But I think this kind of opened up opportunities for the organizations that are still hiring. Um, where they could pick up this really great talent that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to. Um, but yeah, I think it could be really different for each organization than you might see for. Yeah, great. Uh, Ty? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of in an interesting uh, position because we, um, we service kind of a mix of different types of com uh, companies in different industries, right? So we, um, uh, the majority of our customers are growing and growing rapidly in this season right like brands like PillPack that are like you know seeing exponential growth mm -hmm. uh through uh through the pandemic right so the, the pandemic has actually accelerated their growth um and then we work a good bit in healthcare where we're seeing like healthcare companies that are depending on the vertical or be impacted different ways um uh by covid um and are having acute uh you know hiring challenges in various area their, areas of their businesses and then we have some customers that typically didn't deal in like high volume at all that suddenly like find themselves kind of dealing in volume. They're growing faster. They've got reduced headcount on the TA side. Um, and they're, mm -hmm. they're having to kind of do more with less. They're getting, I mean, I just think about myself, we have a customer success uh, role opening right now. And uh, we, uh, I posted, I had 250 applications in 24 hours. And uh, you know, it, it's like, it's these sort of challenges that like, it's an, it's an interesting market where it's like really hot, for some, it's kind of moderately hot to cool for others, but we're all experiencing just a lot of candidate flow um, and even like lag, like I get a lot of applications, but then I go to follow up with candidates and uh, only a very small subset of them actually get back to me with, in, in, with any sort of uh, sense of urgency. So yeah, we're seeing it's kind of an interesting mix kind of across the board that, that, we've, that we've observed across our customer base. Yeah, and, and I think is like, you know, most companies now have clearly gone remote or have had to go remote. 
throughout hiring, you're sort of seeing companies shift their mindset a little bit and be way more open to, to, to remote workforces than they ever were. And what that does is it allows for an influx of candidates, right? I mean, companies are hiring places now that they never thought they would. And we're hearing this a lot at Codility. Um, people are really hiring on a global scale unlike never before. And, and I, I think that kind of bleeds into my next question. I mean, really getting into remote work here. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious what sort of your predictions for remote work are, right? So we're, we're in COVID-19, we're all working remote for the most part. Um, those are those of us who are able to. Um, is it sustainable? Like, is it sustainable? Is it truly the future? Is it not? Um, and and you know, there's a lot of debates on this and uh, and and what it's actually going to look like coming out of COVID. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. And in time, maybe, maybe you can just pick it up there as well. Um, what are you What are you kind of seeing for partners? And 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 what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that I, I think remote work to some degree is is sort of here to stay, um, right? Like I we we just moved homes because I needed more space for my home office, and I I feel we we're all sort of rethinking sort of what the home should look like to incorporate the office to some degree, right? Um, so I think it's I think it's here for good, but I don't think it's a permanent fixture that we're 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 you know, set you know five days a week uh, at home. Um, we're starting at Grayscale to kind of have a blended model where we have, uh, you know, a few days in a co-working space, a few days from home um, that we'll start to kind of experiment with. So I think you're going to have a, a blend with some extremes on both ends, but I think most of us are moving toward a blended uh, workforce in the future. And um, Shweta, I imagine that you're speaking to talent a lot. You're speaking to hiring managers. They all have opinions. They all have desires. What are you? What like? What are you hearing? Um, you know, I. So what we've done, we've you know, we've all been remote since middle of March, and we're planning to stay remote until the end of April at least, and we're going to revisit at that time. Prior to the pandemic, we were not a remote first company. We were very much, we want everybody to be in the office. We want to be able to collaborate. Uh, you know, foster culture. Um, and relationships amongst others. Um, we did have some people who had been top performers who had chosen to to relocate to other cities within the US and that was okay. But for the most part, it was in office roles. So we were very constrained in terms of where we were hiring. Since the pandemic and since we've all been working remotely, we've actually found different ways of being synergistic amongst each other and keeping the camaraderie um, up. Uh, and, you know, the performance uh, has spoken for itself. We've our Q2, when in the pandemic, we over exceeded Q2 last year with half of the sales force. It was incredible to see um, and all working from home. So I think we are going to see definitely a blended model. We are looking also at different hubs. So we have San Francisco and Toronto as our main headquarters. We've now um, created a hub in Chicago, a hub in L.A., hopefully one next year uh, somewhere else, which I can't say yet. Um, and so, you know, being able to have people in those in those cities or proximity where they can, you know, work from home when they choose to, but also they can come together when they choose, I think is is going to be really valuable. I can't wait. I am. Um, no, I, I love that. And I think that, you know, it's really in line a lot with Codility is doing. Right. So we are. Uh, we're very much thinking past COVID and, and, and what does this look like? And I think this idea of this hybrid or blended model is personally, I think that, that that's where a lot of companies are going to be, right? So, so we've actually said, okay, we're not really having an HQ anywhere. We're going to have hubs in San Francisco, Warsaw, Ber Berlin, and London. Um, and it's kind of sort of up to the talent. Like if you, uh, if you want to be in an office 100% of the time and you can be in one of our hubs, great. If you want a hybrid model, great. If you want to be remote 100% of the time, great. I have this big belief and I'm curious, and Jeremy, please weigh in here too as well. And I'm especially given the, the product that, 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 that you have and a lot of the talent that, that, that sort of comes through, through your product. I'm really curious. I, I kind of think that it's not like, I don't know if it's really so much the companies to, to decide versus the talent is going to dictate the future of this, right? Because I think for San Francisco, for example, where, 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 where I sit, a lot of people have fled this city. It's an expensive city. Uh, they're taking their salaries. They're, they're, they're moving into larger homes and, and in other places throughout the country. Um, we're seeing the same thing happen throughout Europe. Um, what do you think? Like, is it 
are, are companies going to be able to mandate and dictate that people be in an office 100% moving forward, or do you think those days are just completely over? I mean, I think I've had a similar experience to what you guys were describing too, where when everything was locking down, I was so used to working on site at the office every day, just like all of our other employees too. And I was thinking like, oh, how is this all gonna work? How are we gonna stay connected? How are we gonna be productive? But people have been, everyone's been productive. Everyone's been communicating effectively. We all have the right technology in place. Um, and we're still, it's a little challenging at times, but we're still building these relationships with employees virtually. But yeah, I, I don't think necessarily as we move past COVID, everything will be completely remote, but definitely that hybrid type of environment that you guys were talking about. Um, a lot of these larger organizations, I think, are going to be going to these office hubs, like you guys were saying, too, or maybe smaller size offices just spread out in different areas of the country. Um, but yeah, I think I think this is here to stay, and I think this is sustainable in a way that employees are productive, they're, they're getting everything done, we're still able to have these relationships and work really effectively remotely. And so I, I do see this kind of being the thing going forward where there is some type of hybrid environment. And I think when you're recruiting talent from different areas of the country, or even in some cases, different areas of the world, and you have these expanded talent pools, like Ty mentioned that in 24 hours, he had a couple of hundred candidates apply for that one role. I think we could also expect that talent acquisition teams will probably grow too to, to help keep up with hiring plans and be able to effectively work through all these talent pools too. Yeah, yeah. And I think sort of piggybacking off that a little bit, I mean, there's some big challenges, right? I, I think when we think about having remote first workforces and how we continue to scale and offer amazing candidate experiences and all of those things, what do we sort of see in Ty? I, I, you can probably write a book on this, but um, <laughs> what do you see as the challenges around this as companies are trying to figure this out and as we scale and lean more into remote work? Um, and how can we overcome them? And, and I think as we answer this question, maybe very much thinking through the lens of, of candidate experience and have it in technologies and products to sort of help support us in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I think we're kind of, as businesses all over the map as far as like how we're, uh, how we're preparing for the kind of new reality, right? And I think, there are a percentage of companies that are still in this mindset of like, we just kind of got to weather the storm and then it's kind of back to the way things used to be. And um, I think that's becoming less and less the case, but there's still some companies that fall into that bucket. The vast majority are now kind of waking up to like, okay, right, 2020 is gone and COVID is still like, the, like remote work is like still happening and it's going to happen probably the better part of next year, whether we like it or not. Right. And so how do we now start preparing for that reality from a, from a TA standpoint, from an onboarding standpoint, from a learning and development standpoint, all these things that suddenly have to be flipped on their heads and reimagined, right? So, um, so kind of where we come in, the piece of the pie that we come into is around, you know, the, the candidate engagement piece through the onboarding. And, and that's an interesting world. You know, you think just about like, you know, I had to onboard our first um, virtual employee a few months back and a totally different set of skills than onboarding a, an employee in person, right? Like completely different throughout the rule book. You got to completely reimagine it from the ground up. Same with like a lot of core TA functions, you know, the, the, um, the way that you're engaging with talent, the channels that you're, that you're using, how, um, how much of the process is manual uh, versus automated and, and leveraging automated uh, automation in thoughtful ways, like all these things that we were kind of able to, a lot of us were just, and I'm guilty of this too, like just kind of brute forcing it, like pre-COVID, suddenly you don't have that luxury anymore. You can't throw more bodies at the problem. Like, so you have to sort of reimagine these solutions from the ground up. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's that's some things that I'm that I'm sort of seeing currently. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I'm no. gonna just jump in here for a quick second because um, it's funny, a few years ago, maybe four years ago, I was you know on a panel and I said, Listen, you know, recruiters, TA, we've got to get out from behind the computer. Get away from your computer. Go out there. You got to be, you know, meeting people and and talking to candidates, whether that's going to a meetup or whether that's, you know, going to campuses or, or other social events. Well, here we are now in 2020. There's no getting away. <laughs> you can't get out there um, to engage with candidates in the same way anymore. So I'm kind of eating my own words. Um, but I think it is even more important now than ever that recruiters and companies focus on their brand 
so that mm -hmm. they can attract really great talent. Yeah, and I, I imagine bringing on the right platforms, products to sort of assist you with that, especially this era, right, is gonna be, is gonna be critical in that. And I think about, if we think about automation and digitalization, like how is that, like what is the must behind that? And how is that changing the way that we are working and hiring, right? Because especially if now, okay, now if I'm thinking about a recruiter and I think about recruiters at Codilly, you know, they are truly hiring globally. They're in many different time zones. Um, not, not only that, people who are working from home are also parenting. They have personal lives, can't be, always can't be on, right? Um, I was just complaining right <laughs> before this. I was like, oh my God, I don't even have kids. And by the way, I know that I'm, in, and this even sounds horrible saying this, I know in a COVID era, I'm privileged in saying that, but like we have dogs running around, we have like street noise going on, reboots, and it's not, it's not the same, right? It's not the same as when you're, when you're face to face. And so, so how, you know, what one, what is the importance of automation and digitization? And then, and then what, like, how is that changing the way we work in hiring moving forward? And, and is it, is it a must and a staple in, in sort of succeeding <clears throat> in gaining the best talent? Yeah. Can 100%. I, I'll, I'll um, jump in go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about when you were talking about getting out from behind your desk and how things are changing with remote hiring and remote work to, um, as far as digitalization, I think something that's been a really big change is virtual hiring events. So a lot of organizations are putting on different types of virtual hiring events in lieu of the career fairs that they're used to relying on to source engaged candidates. And I think that's going to continue going forward, even when we can meet more in person. I think we're finding that these hiring events can be really effective for meeting a lot of really engaged candidates. They're a little more cost effective. They're more convenient. They're, they're really good, especially if you're recruiting non-local candidates too. Um, but I think in regard to digital, digitalization, you can't underestimate the, the importance of these virtual hiring events that have been happening. Um, that was one thing. Shweta, what were you about to say? Sorry. Um, I was just gonna say, so when you know the pandemic happened, um, my RTA team did get smaller. Um, and so we had to, again, do more with less. I did not have candidate experience specialists helping me with my scheduling and, and, and whatnot anymore. So I really had to rely on Lever and our integrations with other partners to help me be more effective and get the most out of my day, again, as a parent with a dog running around. Um, and so whether it's, you know, our, our um, intercandidate interview links that I can just send out to people so they can schedule time with me, the automation tools so that we have, you know, some questions that we can to bring the number from 250 like you had, Ty, you know, down to like your top 25 people that fit your criteria. The Zoom integrations for video interviewing, all of that has saved me so much time um, and allowed me to spend more time either doing things like this or if not away from my laptop, at least on the phone or in a Zoom call talking to candidates, which is what we should all be doing. Mm -hmm. So so what about like, and especially if you're thinking about automization, because I'm going to push back a little bit here and say like, you know, especially some of these like virtual hiring events and things like that, what it, you, you know, gosh, there is this thing of just like Zoom fatigue, technology fatigue. And I think one of the things I love about uh, Ty and Jeremy, like both of your products is like, it's a little bit different than that, right? It's 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 kind of fresh, it's different. It's offering a little bit of a different experience, but but like what, I mean, that's that's gotta be part of this as well, right? Part of this conversation, like, uh, you know, being in the role that I'm in, you know, I'm leading the people and the talent function. And we're always thinking of ways to um, engage folks and bring them together. But 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 I also know that a lot of people, the last thing they want is like a forced virtual happy hour at the end of the day where they've been on Zoom calls all day, right? Especially if you have other responsibilities. And so, so like, I'm trying, the, the, the question here is really like, where is the balance of like fatiguing people out and exhausting them versus creating experiences that still engage people? Uh, and Ty, I'd really be curious with you because I, I do think what what you offer is is a very different way to sort of engage folks. But but curious what your thoughts are around that question in general. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in, and I'm I'm curious to hear Jeremy's thoughts too, just on the the the, the uh, video fatigue and some of that stuff. So I'll 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 let him feel that. But yeah, just so um, let's just kind of call out like you know I think automation gets a bad rap first and foremost, and for very good reason. We've all been on the other end of like really 
crap automation, right? That is very like impersonal. It's 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 irritating when we experience it. It feels like we're like we as the individual are an afterthought, right? And so um, I, that's to be avoided at all costs. And so w when you when you think about like you know really automation just should just kind of work behind the scenes that should uh, help facilitate facilitate the building of relationships, right? And and um, and, and that's when it's at its best, right? Is it, it kind of gets out of the way, it's in the background and it allows a recruiter like Shweta or Jason, like someone on your team to be able to, right, to kind of scale themselves in a way that they can create those meaningful moments uh, to where, um, you know, candidates aren't falling through the cracks. There's, you know, general sort of, um, you know, um, visibility into the overall process and, um, and so th these experiences, when stepped back and kind of you know mapped out, autom automation can really help kind of underpin. And uh, so to me, it's like it's all about the end goal is around doing what we as recruiters are like you know got into this game to do. And I think the best recruiters do well is to foster relationship and find good matches between people and 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 uh, and jobs. And so um, so yeah, so that sort of when it, when we talk about technology, it really should just start to like fall into the background right like that's when it's working well is you don't even realize it's working especially for the candidate on the other end so just some thoughts love that jeremy yeah and i don't want to talk too too much about spark hire but one of the most impactful features that we provide is something called a one-way video interview so it's different than things like zoom and that it's asynchronous where an employer can set up questions in advance and then candidates can record video responses on their own time before a deadline so not only does this kind of automate a pre-screening process because it's it's being done on the candidate's own time it's being reviewed by a hiring team at their own convenience too um, but it's just a more convenient process also where it, you talked about zoom fatigue and things like that where it, a candidate's able to do it whenever it's convenient for them when, when they're not feeling so fatigued by being on video and things like that and employers can record uh, pretty much their own pre-recorded videos. They're almost like one of many videos that candidates see throughout the process to help keep that engaged too, um, to kind of help automate that as well. And I, I think what we're seeing too is uh, all these different HR technologies, they are being, most of the employers find it really valuable to have it integrated with their applicant tracking system. As an example, Spark Hire is integrated with Lever, and I think it helps automate a lot of tasks, which can free up a lot of time so that I think a lot of these roles are becoming a lot more strategic in nature and people are able to really focus on some of their highest priorities so that they're really being most productive and, and kind of working bigger than they are, like Shweta was saying. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think certain things like one-way video interviews can provide like a more convenient experience too, where you can help eliminate some of that fatigue with being on video. So, so Jeremy, building on top of this, and before we move on from the conversation, we have, we have, looks like we have over 170 people watching this right now, right? So I imagine some of them are going, okay, I know I need to beef up sort of my toolkit and automation and, and, and what that sort of looks like and engagement. What would the three of you say, like, if, if you were, you know, if you were helping someone who's trying to figure this out, what do you think, what do you think is a must? or 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 is a need for people to have in their sort of future of work, work toolkits what are some uh platforms or technologies or tools out there that, that 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 you personally would recommend um and get people thinking about sure I'll, I'll go ahead uh, so so I, I think uh you know for one i think it starts like at, with a strong foundation right and so i think it, it that means having a, a an ats that that makes it easy to integrate with. So, you know, the more robust the APIs and uh, the ability to kind of plug in uh, at various points throughout the process, the better, right? That that unlocks a lot of different optionality, right? So like Lever, for example, like great job of making it super simple to integrate with um, that you then can take technology and plug it in at various different stages that allow, to, allow you to do some really interesting things like automate communication throughout the process right so like a tool like like grayscale um we see just using a you know changing up the channels you're using right now in this climate from getting away from just an email driven process to one where you're blending email and text um and so um like simple things like just having a right course system that allows for strong integrations with 
tools like, and I'm not trying to, you know, um, prescribe any one tool, but like a Spark Hire or Grayscale or any others that can then plug in, because then you get that much more power from those solutions when they're more deeply integrated. So I think that's one. I think it starts with a strong foundation, and then you kind of build off of that. And, and Ty, just, 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 I'm going to jump in there really quick. So if any of you are new, if you're in your role or in this talent role and you're sort of a buyer for the first time or you don't have much experience doing that, this is the great, this is like my favorite first question is, what do your integrations look like? And, and, and how, how, and how in depth are they, right? A lot of companies, what you'll find is a lot of companies will say, oh, that's on the horizon. It's coming soon. Or yes, we integrate, but understanding what the integration looks like and how many integrations. And there's companies I think that take on different business models. Like they're like, you know what? We're going to be the winner on integrations. And I think that's really, really interesting. And it's the most important question that I ask when I'm when I'm buying a product or a technology or a tool um, because it's so critical in terms of automation. Um, Shweta or Jeremy, in in any thoughts there as well? Yeah. So. Um that's my first question as well. So I've been a buyer of platforms previously. Um, and to be honest, I, you know, I've had other you know, vendors come to me saying like, oh, you should buy this for this. And I said, does it integrate with Lover? Does it integrate with my ATS? This is when I was on the um, client side. Uh, and if it didn't, I said, I wasn't going to buy it. And the reason being, don't make my life harder. Don't make me leave my main tool where I am working and go out to something and log in somewhere else. That's just not effective i want like the two-way communication between my tools um and i want them all to live in one system of record so that if i go on vacation somebody can pick up for me um so i i, I can't agree more i think the number one question should be who do you integrate with and how deep is the integration was the integration code co-developed is it an open api etc Right, I think integrations can totally shift a conversation like that. And ultimately, you want, if someone's implementing new technology, you want it to be easy for them. You want it to be easy for their candidates to use. So, integration is so important. Um, other questions to think about too, when you're when you're thinking about integrations and you're trying to purchase technology, is uh, who else is using the integration? They don't necessarily have to list specifically which companies, but just getting an idea or a ballpark number, how many people are actually using this integration. I think it is really helpful to understand too. Are people, is this actually working well for other companies too? Um, but yeah, when we think about other tools that should be in the toolkit, uh, we talked about video interviewing, web conferencing. Um, I think SMS texting with candidates has been really effective. And I think that's going to be really effective going forward too. And when we think moving past just the hiring process also, I think it's super important to have some type of employee engagement tools too to keep everyone engaged, to keep everyone connected, to gather meaningful feedback that you can use to, to help provide a better experience for your employees. Oh, love that, love that. And I, you know, as we switch switch gears here a little bit and, and sort of just, just watching time, I think that as we think about going into 2021, um, it, I think a lot of companies are rethinking the skills that really matter. Right. So, so, you know, it's been a trend in the last few years and there's been a lot of conversations where companies are over indexing on the, the technical aspects of a role and not giving enough attention to sort of like the soft skills or the attributes that make someone truly successful in a role. But as we think about this world that we find ourselves in with remote work and knowing that we're going to move to some sort of probably hybrid model coming out of this and into the future and as we go into 2021, what do you guys, what do you believe is the the main skills that company need most in 2021? And and I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with you because um, you're probably doing more interviewing even, even than these two guys here. So I'm, I'm really curious how you're sort of thinking about that as, as the conversation shifted at all in your company and what does that look like moving forward? Yeah, it's so, it's so funny because I was having this discussion the other day. Um, the soft skills are, are really important now um, and, and the communication skills. We need um, individuals to be able to communicate in a very different way. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have people sitting side by side coding anymore uh, where they can learn in that manner, right? So now if you want to do pair programming, you have to do it virtually um, and whatnot. So especially for those people that are going to be more senior and if they're going to be able to mentor and try to lead others, <clears throat> excuse me, 
then those soft skills, those communication skills, and the way that they engage um, is going to be more uh, valuable than ever. Yeah, no, I, I was, as you, as you were chatting, I was just thinking, <laughs> I've said this a couple times recently, but if anything, what remote does, it shines a light on, on sort of, when I think about managers specifically, where managers fall really short with those core management skills, like, you know, ability to give really great feedback, ability to sort of set a vision and bring people along, um, ability to give recognition, because you have to over index in all those areas, right, when you're remote. And um, it's another reason why a lot of a lot of these companies out there that do management training are backed up for months right now, because every company is realizing, holy smokes, like we we literally have not invested enough in management training and these soft skills really, really matter. Uh, Jeremy, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, um, so when I've been hiring in the past, usually I've been hiring for sales positions and a few skills that I think are gonna be the top ones as we move into the new year. Definitely adaptability, creativity, emotional intelligence, critical thinking. Um, I this gets thrown around a lot too, but tech savviness more than ever as we're talking about automation and all sorts of new software and how people are going to be interacting with a lot of different software and being able to, to use that to your advantage is going to be really helpful too, I think. Great, great. And Ty, I, I don't and, want to put... And being self-motivated. Yeah. I just want to jump in to say that people that are really self-motivated um, is, is very valuable because and, you know, we're all on our own. We can get easily distracted. I don't know if you saw my dog run over to me just a minute ago. Um, and we have to be able to get ourselves back on task. Yeah. And, and, and Ty, not to put you on the spot, and actually anyone can answer this, but I think the trick is, and I imagine for a lot of the people watching, is how do you actually successfully measure those skills in a non-biased way, right, or an unbiased way? Um, because I think actually a lot of companies still struggle with that, right? It's so much easier especially for a lot of hiring managers out there to measure the technical side of things, but how do you measure things like soft skills? Yeah, I, I, I think that this is something that we've, we've really struggled with as of late. And, and it's, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll, you know, to me, I think it comes back to like core company values uh, as one is like, we're, you know, culture is such an important uh, element more so than I think that it's ever been right. How do you keep a, a workforce, uh, excited, motivated, all pointed the same direction after the same goal without like a very strong uh, culture. And that's so hard to do with everyone remote, right? Like it's so hard to, to, to emphasize those things. And so for us, we've had to go through an exercise to where our, our culture sort of like, you know, bubbled up organically while we were all in the office together. But as, as remote, as we've all been remote, we've had to really be intentional as far as how we underpin and like celebrate and, and, and um, call people out when they're really uh, embracing those core values. And, um, and so I think that's been, that's been big for us, the learning experience is just like how difficult it is to kind of foster that. Um, but, but that for us has been, been huge uh, to kind of help, to help with some of that. I, 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 I love what you're adding there because I'm thinking about Codility right now and right where we're at, we're learning more than ever the importance of tripling down on our own values and talking about them even more in our vision um, because as we hire in sort of this new world and as we expand and grow having having those things front of mind and make sure that we're measuring them in a structured way in our recruiting process is 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 huge right and not to say that we didn't do a great job of it before but it's 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 taken on a whole new light because companies are changing they just are innately changing through this and they're coming out differently and need to be a little bit different. Um, uh, Jeremy or Shweta, in any thoughts around sort of how we even think about beginning to measure sort of the soft skill side of things? Yeah, I think it's important to kind of map this out at the very beginning of when you're deciding that you need to hire for a specific role. It takes a lot of collaboration between the actual direct manager and uh, other hiring stakeholders too to really understand what are the very top skills that we're looking for how are we going to in our in our best effort concretely assess this and you structure your interview questions that way you can create different rankings to rank candidates against those and, and score them against that criteria um, to try to remain as objective as possible and make sure that the group of people or the panel that is responsible for interviewing candidates too um, it's a diverse group of, of panelists also. I think that's super important to make sure that it's a very 
structured way to assess these types of soft skills. That's great. Yeah, I think structured interviewing wins the day all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we have a few minutes before this, the poll pops up and we have Q&A, so if you haven't dropped questions yet, please start doing that. We want to make sure that we prioritize and, and get to you here in a few minutes. I do want to just just quickly, uh, just a couple more questions, and one is, and there's there can be you know a six-hour webinar on the topic of equity and diversity in recruiting right now, but when we think about remote hiring, I'm curious some of your thoughts on just how remote hiring helps to enhance equity and diversity and sort of the mission around that. Yeah, I could jump in on that. I, I think, um, like you were saying, th this is a lot to unpack, but I think remote hiring, it generally breaks down geographical barriers, which is going to expand a talent pool across the country or maybe even in some cases into other areas of the world. And because of that expanded talent pool, employers then have access to candidates from more cultures, different generations, more sexual orientations, more religions. And Essentially, they just have more diversity in their talent pool, for the back of, lack of a better term. Um, so yeah, I think just by expanding this talent pool and breaking down these barriers, you're going to have a lot more diversity in, in the pool. Yep. I mean, we were very intentional at Lever. There's a reason why Toronto was chosen um, as the second headquarters for the organization. It's Toronto. Yes, we're in Canada, but it is an exceptionally diverse city, um, both eth ethnically. Um, religion etc but also you know that's why we've chosen chicago and that's why we've also chosen la but i think the core for us in terms of diversity is we are looking for the diversity of thought and the diversity of thought from problem solving really does come from hiring people from all different backgrounds and roads of life some people who have pivoted in their careers and suddenly now they're you know they're engineers where right? they were doing something else before um, that's been part of our motto from for eight years, and it's uh, sort of just well so far. Yeah, no, I, I love that you said that because I always think diversity is actually um, the diversity of thought and experiences and backgrounds is what gets you that right. So, so just just doubling down on that. But I think I think about returning parents to the market, right, who still have to sort of watch kids and what that looks like, and and not having a long commute, it 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 gives them access to. Um, to opportunities that they wouldn't have before. I think about veterans, veterans who are entering the market, and some of them may be fearful to move to a city like San Francisco. Can I afford it? Can I navigate it? What does it look like? Um, and all of a sudden, they, they have access, and they have access in a completely different way. And so, um, absolutely, I think remote work is, is going to do amazing things and gives us access and sort of uh, – I like to say sort of try to level the playing field a little bit more for folks with, with – um, non-traditional backgrounds even, right? So, um, Ty, Ty, in, in, anything to add there? I mean, I think there's, uh, I think all the points made are, are spot on. I think there, there is a, you know, that there's a, there's a possibly, I'll argue, a negative side to us all working remote and, and widening our, our, our talent pool globally, right? Is that suddenly you have so many candidates that you can choose from. There's so many options you do have that, that I think it's, Whenever you're, um, when there's um, an abundance, it's very easy to fall back on those kind of knee-jerk uh, habits that have formed, those those unconscious biases that that you just need to find ways to screen down your 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 resume pool and need to find ways to to kind of weed candidates out of the process. And so I think it's, um, you know, I think that's why back to like a structured interview process is so important. Like there is no way that you can, you know, you can. Uh, approach your hiring process uh, and, and kind of shoot from the hip and come out the other side with a uh, completely unbiased uh, hire, right? Like you're, we're, and we all know this, right? And the science backs this up, but it's like, um, but I think if we if we um, throw the net too wide without the right structure, the right framework in place, um, that unconscious conscious bias is going to come in time and time again and undermine what what we have the best intentions of trying to accomplish. So. Um, so that's been something we've really been working on and we've had a quasi structured process, but we've moved to like, I, I love Lou Adler's, um, performance based hiring model. Um, th that's really helped us a lot and just making sure we maintain that consistency and have as, as much of a unbiased process as we can. So, and I think this is where technologies like 
all that are represented here today um, can really help you with that, right? Because it's really hard to keep structure without having sort of a guide in technology to help guide you, right? So um, I think it plays a big part there. So I, I know, I, you know, I believe the poll is going to pop up any moment. And if it does, please fill that out while we answer sort of this next question. But um, I'm really curious sort of um, what, are, what are the predictions that all of you have um, for, you know, the future of hiring? Like, what are your top predictions? You know, if you were, if you were, uh, if you were in Vegas, you're going to put some money on it and you, uh, you had to tell, you had to tell all of us, like, where do you think the future of hiring is going? If you had to make maybe one prediction, what would that be? Yeah, I, I think I have a couple of predictions. I think that, uh, because there's going to be a lot more remote hiring, remote work, it's really important to place an emphasis on having a strong remote hiring process and also a strong remote onboarding process. Mm. So I think remote onboarding is going to definitely be, be a top prediction for the future too. I think that there's, as companies continue to adjust to their new normal and everything's kind of resetting, there's probably going to be a few waves of rehiring candidates that were previously laid off earlier in the pandemic. So these talent pools are bigger than ever. Companies have a really good opportunity to make some really awesome hires. And I think that the aspects of companies that candidates find most attractive when they are applying for jobs, that's always evolving. And I think kind of like what we've been saying in this discussion too, I think seeing that a company has an inclusive and diverse culture that they place a strong emphasis on that, I think that's obviously becoming more and more important to candidates and they want to see that throughout the hiring process too. So it's going to be really important to make sure you are prioritizing that and, and really demonstrating your culture throughout your hiring process too. Uh, those are just a couple of predictions. Yeah, I really like the onboarding piece, right? I think every company, yeah. Ty mentioned this earlier, but everyone's sort of faced with that right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Shweta. Um, I think a more humane approach to candidate experience um, is, is where we have to go if we want to uh, attract the best talent. And uh, I know in speaking with candidates, um, they often you know, have multiple roles that they can choose from and they do choose to go with the company that gave them the best experience because it's a testament to their culture and to their values. So uh, I think companies have to invest in that. Yeah, yeah. Ty? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Shweta just said. I think definitely like, Putting uh, putting the candidate first and creating um, you know uh, being intentional about how do we create meaningful relationships with our with our candidates um, is no longer a nice to have. Like I feel like this is there's been this shift post COVID that like we the 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 industry we love to talk about candidate experience and like but it's always been like on the the vendor side of it it's always that fluffy thing that like doesn't actually no one actually opens their checkbook and 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 uh, and it kind of doubles down on it uh, by and large, but there's a lot more talk than there is actually like execution behind it. And I think that shift is occurring where it's no longer something that is seen as this like fluffy, nice to have sort of thing. It's a it's an, a competitive advantage moving towards like table stakes uh, uh, within within the market. I think that's one thing that's exciting about sort of this shift and how quickly things are occurring is like. You know, and companies are just are, are realizing we we have to invest in candidate experience. Back to Shweta's point, and I think overall, kind of broader industry, uh, back to sort of how I see things evolving. I mean, it, it's kind of um, uh, you know, it, it's it's a cliche at this point, but I think you know, you look at recruiting. We typically follow the the the, the marketing sector, right? And so, like, what's what's going on in marketing right now? You've got like the 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 companies that are winning are those that like have core systems that offer great integrations. You're seeing a lot of like a tremendous number, like so much innovation going on with all these different vendors that are solving like these little pieces throughout the process to bridge the gaps. And so again, back to like great core systems with you know, great APIs that you can integrate with. Like I think this is going to be a season in the years to come where there's going to be more and more great innovation and to really leverage it effectively to be able to leverage your um, your codalities and your grayscales and your spark hires. Uh, you need a solution like Lever just to put a whole bow on it here um, to be able to really sort of um, create the kind of experiences that we're talking about, right? Um, and so um, I'm excited for that reality. I think that's where we're cranking. And I think COVID's it's just doing nothing but accelerate us, accelerating us down that path. And Ty, complete side note, we need to talk about 
grayscale plus codility and like we need to we, we need to look into that product um, uh, yeah okay we have time for a couple of questions um, and uh, one is it, you know we talked a little bit about remote onboarding um, so how, how are we managing remote onboarding and how do we sure and how do we ensure an outstanding employee experience so if you guys want to share any learnings along the way um, and sort of and sort of what you're trying and experimenting with so far um, I don't I don't have the answers this is not my area of specialization um, however I think it really does start from the second that you know the candidate signs their offer onboarding starts at that moment so making sure that they're connected to the right people within our organization to make them feel already welcome and part of the family before day one the little things like making sure that they've received the technology that they need to be successful on day one and that you can get it all set up for them is is huge because nothing's more frustrating than not having that. Um, and then really helping them to get to know a others that are also hopefully onboarding around the same time or, or putting them with a buddy um, so that they have people that they can go and ask questions to and in introducing them to the company. So we do all hands every two weeks. We make sure that we introduce our new hires and then you know once they're a month in or so, we'll let them MC um, as well so people can see their personalities if they don't work with them all the time. Lots of little things to just make people feel very welcome and included. Yeah, I love it. It starts starts the moment they sign, right? It absolutely does. Um, uh, Jeremy, any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I really agree with all the things that Shweta was saying. Like in the moment that you make someone an offer, I definitely encourage using something like a video message where you can send a video in the email with the official offer to congratulate them and make them feel really excited about the offer that they just got. Um, so that's one way from just the beginning of that, the outset of that experience. Um, but get them introduced, get them acclimated with the other team members. We do something called cross-department activities each month where different groups of employees are, are put into groups together to work on an activity, even virtually together. And usually it's with people that aren't necessarily in your department so that you're interacting with people that maybe you don't necessarily interact with on a daily basis. So get people acclimated in that way. Um, all hands meetings are a great, great way to introduce new team members and get them to introduce themselves to the rest of the company. And something that uh, our CEO has been doing to get everyone to feel really connected with the organization at large too is each week he records a new video that he sends out to everyone at the company just to give an update of what's going on in each of the departments. It usually involves introducing new team members also and it's a really great way to keep everyone connected. Um, so those are just a few ways just to keep everyone connected throughout that process. Yeah, and, and I'll jump in here too. You know, we're we're having to rethink this from the ground up, from the technologies that we use to to even to Shweta's point, like actually just getting people technology right now is taking longer than usual. Like Apple is really backed up on delivery times and getting ahead of that. And then if you're a multinational company. Uh, there are restrictions right now with COVID, like it's very, very complex. And so I think one of the things is getting ahead of it as soon as possible. Uh, and and so that's one, bringing the human side back into it, Jeremy, I love that. I actually just started doing that with our company as well. So I send out sort of these, like, instead of monthly, like, hey, these are my thoughts on the market. These are my thoughts on our internal culture. Here's what's on my mind. I've, I've recorded it. I tried it for the first time a few weeks ago and got really great feedback on it, right? It was just a different sort of medium that they could sort of see me in and, and sort of and, and sort of see us engaged a little bit more. Um, we're thinking about, um, you know, we brought on Sapling to sort of help with our onboarding. We're actually going live with it December 1st, uh, introducing video, um, some interaction. We're very much thinking about how how do we how do we create connection earlier in sort of the onboarding funnel, if you will, and what does that look like? Um, and and I, I do think the connection piece is the biggest piece here. And I don't think anyone's actually solved this yet. I think every company's struggling with that, and we, we all need to sort of share strategies around it. But that's the thing that 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 we're sort of constantly looking at and and, and thinking about. Um, next question, Ty, and I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw this one to you. Um, with remote hiring booming, do companies still keep looking for employees in a specific location or close to the office for remote positions? So meaning like you know. Like, 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 what are you seeing? Like, what are your thoughts? Uh, do they need to sort of still be in the same area? Can they just kind of be anywhere? Like, like, what's a good strategy? Should they be sort of hubs? How are you, how are you guys kind of thinking of this? 
I'm, I'm no expert uh, on this. I'm actually uh, uh, punt this to Shweta. I think she might have something more interesting to say. Uh. Um, yeah, we are ideally trying to have people around the different hubs so that they do have the flexibility of working from home or going into an office when they want to. Um, but listen, if it's a hard to fill role or really great candidate and they're out in the middle of nowhere, no problem. We will we will hire them. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's our philosophy too. Like we're really creating a remote first company, which means that in our processes and our communication and our structures, we're always remote first. Um, I think that if you, going back to our conversation about equity and diversity, I think uh, if you try to isolate and focus on just certain cities, it, it becomes difficult. But also with that being said, we still have to realize that like not everyone wants to be 100% remote. They do want sort of a hybrid model. They, they, they want to go somewhere. And I think that every company, this is going to look a little bit different. There's cost perspectives. Like when we do come out of, when we do come out of COVID, um, are, are you going to be able to afford to bring everyone together once or twice a year? Is that within your budget? If it's absolutely not within your budget, like maybe you, you are thinking about having some, some hubs where they can kind of come and have more of a hybrid model. So there's different strategies for different companies. I, I, I think economics plays, plays a little bit on that as well. Um, but, uh, but, but again, I think we're all sort of trying to figure that out together at Codility, we're going sort of the hybrid, um, hub model, uh, that Shweta and I spoke to before. Um, well, any final questions? I think we're like right at 1101, uh, Kate, I, I, I believe we're out of time. She's telling me we're out of time. Sorry. Uh, but thank you. Thanks everyone so much. Thank you, uh, to the panel for the wonderful discussion. It was wonderful seeing all of, all of you and just also, um, learning from you as well. And uh, I can't wait to do this again. Thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll see you again soon. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week. Stay healthy and safe. Uh, and, uh, you know, try to stay sane through 2020. We're almost to 2021. We're going to get there. Uh, see you all yeah, soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.